This is a HeadGum Podcast. The holidays are approaching us, and now is the time for you to rack up on your gift orders. Start with Tee Public. Go to blackgirlnerds.com forward slash t-shirts, where you can get select sizes currently at $14. Now, if you miss this sale that is going on right now, don't worry. Save our Tee Public store to your browser and come back later because we're going to have some more sales coming up this November. Also, look for an unboxing video from me on Periscope of all of our latest and greatest merchandise from Tee Public. If you haven't checked out our new store already, Tee Public has done a whole website redesign and there's been some new additional merchandise added to our store. Tee Public is expanding past t shirts. Tee Public now has coffee mugs, posters, notebooks, laptop carrying cases. There's so much that you can choose from. Also, we have new designs that include Wonder Woman, Star Wars. We even have characters from the Netflix TV series Orange is the New Black. So you have a lot of options to select at Tee Public. Go to our store, blackgirlnerds.com forward slash t-shirts. Again, that is blackgirlnerds.com forward slash t-shirts and take advantage of all we have to offer now is the time to do your christmas shopping guys don't wait to the last minute get it done get it now that way you don't have to wait on the shipping that way you don't have to wait on figuring out what you want to get for your friends and your family members you got it right here and you've got a sale happening where you can save some money so blackgirlnerds.com forward slash t-shirts over at Public. What's going on? It's Soraya from Empire, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. This is Rain Roberts. I'm a creative executive at Lucasfilm, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. What's up, y'all? It's producer Will Packer, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Keep it locked right here. I am Belisha Butterfield-Jones, and I serve as the head of Black Community Engagement for Google, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds podcast this is mildred lewis creator of agents of the realm and you are listening to black girl nerds podcast my name is greg pock i'm the writer of totally awesome hulk and king's way west and i've got it called kickstarter secrets feel free to check that out but most importantly you are listening to the black girl nerds podcast and it is awesome hi my name is natalie mcgriff creator of the Adventures of Moxie McGriff comic, and you're listening to Black Girl Nerd Podcast. Hey, y'all, this is LeVar Burton, Kunta, Jordy, Reading Rainbow Guy. You are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. It is the bomb diggity podcast on the interwebs, but you don't have to take my word. Thanks for tuning into episode 94 of the Black Girl Nerds podcast. My name is Jamie and I am your host. This episode is titled Fantastic Fest and Shadow Hunters. Two segments, but technically there's six segments. I'll explain. In our first segment, we invite Elizabeth DeRazzo. She is the star of the new film called The Greasy Strangler, which premiered over at the Sundance Film Festival. 
She sits down on a one-on-one with Jacqueline. And following that interview is actress Sasha Lane. She plays the lead protagonist in the film American Honey, which we covered the film American Honey over at the Toronto International Film Festival. That's also a one-on-one with Jacqueline. Then we move over to New York Comic Con for our next segment with the cast of Shadowhunters. This is broken up into four segments where we interview each of the main cast members from Shadowhunters. This includes Isaiah Mustafa as Luke Garraway, Harry Shum as Magnus Bain, Alberto Resende as Simon Lewis, Dominic Sherwood as Jace Wayland, Matthew Daddario as Alec Lightwood, Catherine McNamara as Clary Frey, Emerald Tobia as Isabella Lightwood, which I'm pretty sure I've slaughtered her name. And then also we have Cassandra Clare, the author of the Mortal Instruments series, which the TV show is based on, and producers and writers Todd Slavkin and Darren Swimmer. And in these roundtable interviews, the questions that are asked are facilitated by freelance writer Abby White. So that's our show. And for you Shadowhunters fans, if you want to see a little bit more, you can go to our YouTube channel and see some of the video from these interviews that we captured over at New York Comic Con. So sit back, relax, and listen to your favorite TV stars and movie stars talk about their work and their art in this episode. BGN 94, Fantastic Fest, and Shadowhunters. Elizabeth DeRazzo. This Texas native had her first break as a guest starring role in the 2005 episode of Cold Case. Elizabeth continued to guest star on TV for the next few years, and in 2010 she became a recurring guest star on HBO's Eastbound and Down, playing the beloved role of Maria, and also starred in The 33, a star-studded feature about the Chilean mine collapse, and reunited with Eastbound and Down co-star Jillian Bell in the Comedy Central series Idiot Sitter. We're sitting here with Elizabeth Terraza, the star of Greasy Strangler, the premiere film here at Fantastic Fest, which it perfectly personifies everything about Fantastic Fest. So, Elizabeth, thanks for sitting down with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so tell me about you've done acting obviously before, you did Eastbound and Down and other stuff, but when they come with you to this very weird John Waters esque, just Freak of a movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Freak of a movie, what's your reaction? I was, no. <laughs> yeah. No, I was uh, I was not very, like, uh, I wasn't totally opposed to it, but I was just kind of, like, a little scared to take on the material. And um, I was like, no, I don't think I want to go in for this. And then you go in, and Elijah knew me from East Bannon Down, so, like, he, like, I guess, at least from what my agent told me, he, like, really wanted to see what I could do with it. And I was terrified of it and I ended up going and I kind of knew that I was kind of a pick but I was I was terrified I was so terrified of it just because not not per se like the actual like the script because it was funny it was just more the nudity that I was going to have to take on because on Eastbound and Down I did topless but I never and I had one sex scene but never like full on like done what I did in this yeah film. and I was like Oh my god! I don't think I don't think that I didn't think that I could do it. That I could like commit to it, and also I was afraid of what people were going to say. Plus, there's actresses, and it's just like it's so unsexy. It's not meant to be sexy at all, you know. So it's just kind of like. But although I thought like Janet ended up being confident and sort of even like no, Janet's a sex it, symbol in the yeah, film. like she ended up being sexy, which is really weird because. I was so terrified that it wasn't going to be seen that way. And then I've been watching, and I was like, oh, shit. Like, she she got gay. <laughs> yeah, she has her moment. For our audience that maybe doesn't know, like, so the Greasy Strangler follows in that, you know, Plink Flamingos, John Waters, uber weird. Yes. Very meta, but very not. Very undercurrent. But then, you know, there's allegories. And then it's just flat out just strange. So, you know, yes. the you know the Greasy Strangler is um, sort of a horror movie mixed with, you know, a meta comedy. And it's hard to you know, pinned down to it. Yeah. Were you a little bit scared going into it as far as saying people won't get it? Because it is something that if you don't get this kind of genre film, it just comes off as bad, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it took me a second to get it myself. So I was like, is that going to be the reaction? But, you know, it's like, you know, you, you get the work and then you kind of do it and you just hope that people embrace it. Uh, so that's kind of like the approach that I had to take with it. It's just like, okay, it's done. I did it. And now it's out into the world. I had no idea what it was going to become. When I heard we were at Sundance, I was like, what? And I was like, 
huh? Really? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. So were you at the Sundance premiere? I did. I, um, I went and, um, it was, it was insane. It was so crazy. I'd never been. It was really a cool experience. Extremely exhausting. Uh, people party like crazy there. And I was just like, I just want to go to sleep. I just want to sleep. So what was it like seeing it the first time with the audience? Because I will say this is a film that is better with an audience because of like everybody laughs at different places. Yes. Weirdly, it's, I mean, not weirdly, but I mean, I guess that's what makes it so great because it's like something that I'm just like, oh, whatever. I, I would hear people like cracking up and like, oh, really? That moment? Okay. I guess it, it has a little bit of something uh, for everyone. I think like it appeals to certain people, but um, like different things that appeal to certain people. But at Sundance, I remember the first time that I was watching it, I was shit scared and my agent was sitting next to me and I was like oh my god oh my god oh my god what are they gonna do what are they gonna say oh my god oh my god oh my god and we did have some people walk out from the midnight showing but I, it was we weren't the only ones that had the Swiss Swiss something Swiss army man yes thank yeah you. which is also another a good film but if you don't get it yes you don't get it and we tried to get into that and it was like we couldn't but so our film people we had a few walkouts and but a lot of people say, and then they say for the Q and A, and I was like, "Oh wow! Like this actually really like people are actually like loving it." And then saw it a second time there, and it's like, "Oh okay." So it's just it was different every time, but every time I was scared because every time I didn't know what to expect from people. Yeah, I mean we're a site for women of color who are into nerdy things, so we're already we feel that like you know <laughs> yeah. we're the outsiders looking in. You know yeah. what I mean? So we get it, you know. And I would definitely say members of our audience love horror, love the weird, love the wacky. Was it strange for you, you know, coming in as a woman of color to be like, okay, this is this weird genre movie. I don't want to be exploited, but I also want to bring the comedy to it. Yes. How did that feel? That was a very big concern of mine. And I did say that I actually ended up having a conversation with Jim, our director, after the chemistry read, because he said, like, I heard that you have some concerns about this because I did. I, I, I turned it down several times before I actually went in. Well, because I went in for the first audition and then when they asked me to come back for the chemistry read, I was like, no, I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. Like, thank you so much for thinking of me. So then I ended up talking to Jen and he's like, you know, you'll never feel exploited if you're uncomfortable, you know, we can, you know, change this. It's not going to be, you know, directed as written. And, you know, cause there was a bunch of scary stuff like off the page and I was like, oh, this is too much. I don't know if I can do this. And then, you know, I was like, it's like, okay, she is a, you know, female who's pretty much in charge. Like she is very much in charge of who she is and her sexuality too. Like owning it, like not being afraid of it. Although me as Elizabeth, terrifying, <laughs> terrifying. But Janet, I was, I'm not Janet, you know, I, this is someone else and very much in charge of who she is and her sexuality and owning it and loving it and enjoying it, you know? And so that was kind of appealing. I, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, you know, you don't really get that a lot. There's always some sort of like shame associated with, I think. And then also the fact that I was, you know, that I'm Latina, a woman of color, and, and uh, being the female lead, and also that I'm not a size zero. You know, I'm like what we call like a real woman. Mm -hmm. Not that women that aren't a size zero aren't, but like a real like body of no, like, woman, that yeah. represents most of the U.S., you know, because, uh, you know, the size zero, size two, size three, although they're real women as well. It's, you know, I think I'm more representative of what most women, like, what, 60% of women? Yeah, or, or like, 14, yeah, yeah, or above. Yeah. Um, or plus, and I say that in quotation, plus size. We enjoy um, what we eat. Let's yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, I like my tacos. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Texas yeah. at the Alamo Draft House, which is exactly. built on watching movies with food. With food exactly. So let's keep it real. Yeah, exactly. So it's just like, you know, so it was just kind of seeing all of that sort of come together and then just having you know, been thought of to do this, you know, because mostly, you know, he's got it down. I played Maria, who I freaking love, but I was, you know, kind of like this, um, I was like in a little like niche, which I, you know, I, I love that. Like, and I get work off of that, but this was totally different and the opposite of whatever, anything I've ever done. Yeah. Do you consider yourself though, even though I would say you're more comedic in a lot of your roles, although you've done a ton of different stuff, do you feel after this, now that you've kind of said, you know what, I do comedy well, because the like, two of your most identifiable roles are comedic? No. It's so funny. I don't, I don't uh, consider myself like a comedy person. I like to say that I just fell into it because, you know, when I went for Eastbound and Down and I was so blessed and lucky to get that. They asked me to improv, and I was like, I've never done that before. What is that? What do I do? 
And my friend called me and she's like, just, it's yes. And just remember that. Yes. And, and this was like, before I was supposed to go into my, um, what you call a, oh my gosh, it's like when you read in front of like this, the studio as well. So everyone's in the room with you. I can't remember blanking out on the name right now, but, um, you know, for that and, uh, and I had to do 20 minutes of that and I had never done it. And then I got to learn while I was on set, you know, working with Danny McBride and Steve Little, you know, and, uh, the people that I got to work with, you know, like our third season, we had like Lily Tomlin and, you know, John Thompson, it's just like all of these people, all of these greats and like this. And I learned from them and I keep learning. Like I did Idiot Sitter with like, you know, um, Jillian Bell, who's fantastic. And she's a groundlings vet and she wrote for SNL and, you know, Charlotte Newhouse, her, her writing partner. And so I just watch people and I sort of like pick things up. And, and now I find myself in this genre and I'm just always so surprised and shocked. Because I just, I never thought I was funny. Well, you are. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I always cried on cues. I was just like, I'm going to do drama. (laughs) I guess that's, you know, the universe takes you where you want to be, right? You know, and you don't necessarily plan it, but it's where you're supposed to be, right? Yeah, totally. the way I feel about a lot of different things. So this film is produced by Tim League and Elijah Wood, and it's very, you know, fantastic, centric, and, you know, you're bringing it here. What was it like meeting with those guys? Because they bring a different feel to it, too. Because the director, you know, he was a shorts director who had done stuff at Fantastic Fest, and it was kind of their in love with his style. Yes. But then they very much drove, I think, a lot of the creative process. So what was it like getting with those guys? What was great? I mean, I met Elijah on set my first day of set, and I remember I had the Merkin on. I was like, cool, do you want to see the Merkin? And I just, like, lifted up my skirt and showed him my Merkin. And he just started laughing. He was just, like, kind of like, okay, like, this is going to, you know, go. Um, And, I mean, we kind of just had, like, a... Sort of like, um, I mean, we, we stuck to the script, but we had a little bit of, of fun with it. We were able to improv and do things because a lot of us, like Sky, you know, he he's very, um, he has a kind of dry sense of humor, and he's very quick with it as well. And Michael, you just never know what you're going to get. So it's like, you kind of just have to go with it. Like, once he's doing something, you either stick to what you're supposed to do, or you kind of go with it and then just find your way back to the path that you, you're supposed to get back on. So it's kind of great to have that sort of freedom because I think that's where where comedy or the magic happens is like when you're allowed to sort of play. Yeah, and I would say this because like the film is actually composed of mostly like established actors. You know, it, it doesn't look like that necessarily, yeah. but these are people that have been working for a while. Mm-hmm. But, Michael, yeah, been working for <laughs> forever. Ever. But there was also some, you know, I would say like less polished actors. What was that like having the mix between, you know, straight people that have been doing this for forever and maybe some people, this is like their second, third thing. Yeah, no, um, it was, it was an interesting, it's so funny because I always consider, I always think of myself as still green and I've been doing this for 11 years now, but I'm like, I'm still green. I'm like, wait, no, I've been doing it for 11 years. I can't really call myself that anymore. But then when you work with someone that is that gent, like literally first is, time hitting their mark. Yes. First time doing that. Uh, it was kind of wonderful to watch and see them sort of like, find their way and even in some of the takes that I was looking at I was like oh my gosh like you know like when they finally like uh really hit that character it's like you know to watch that process from what you see on set and then when you see what you now we see on screen I was like that is so cool because we had like really great um like the tourists oh my god their that's whole, what I was thinking about first their yeah. whole thing I was like it was so brilliant and it was like there was such an innocence to it because it was kind of like really didn't know what was happening, but they were just kind of like doing it. And it was brilliant. I thought it was so funny. Yeah. Some of my favorite things that I saw from them. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the stuff that's really funny in the film is because it comes from the read and yes. the read is so out there. Yes. Again, you know, I, I can't stress enough how, you know, this comes from that, you know, Hairspray, Pink Flamingos, yes. John Waters, yes. just crazy. You know yes. what I mean? Um, I love John Waters. I know. And it's so great to see that. So, you know, I saw the movie last night and, you know, again, it's just, it's weird. You walk out of it and you're like, you don't need to come out of this feeling like anything other than this is just, you know, bat crap crazy for better words. Yes. And that's the best part of it. But I will ask you this because this is like, we're, we're a side about the weird and the wacky, right? Yeah. What's your, like, super secret, geeky, maybe weird behavior? Because... Behavior? Yeah, because, like... I'm, like, a super big... uh, And actually, it's on my Twitter. I'm a super, like, a fangirl. The the reason I became an actor 
the only reason I got into the, the, like originally got into the business was because I was obsessed. I'm still, and not was, I still very much am obsessed with the X-Files and I wanted to work on it, work with Jillian. And you're speaking our language, me. right? Again, yeah. blackgirlnerds.com. So I was like <laughs> obsessed and like my sister can tell you, like literally no one can call me on Sundays. If they called me, they were in big trouble on Sundays. I would like like make excuses at work. I'm like, I gotta go to church. I can't I can't work on Sundays. Because it was like a whole to do. And I had like all of the tapes and I would name them and I had seen I have seen the first nine seasons of the show at least twenty times each season. I can quote, I can name you every single episode of that show. Like and that's why I became an actor because I wanted to be on that show. And I'm like I'm such a So you're like audition for the last one, right? The new one? Oh, I wanted to be on it so bad. So bad. <laughs> they couldn't put bad. you on like a little I know. Well, no, I mean, I will go as far as telling you that my a couple of my friends and I, a couple of other files and I, we created um, a charity that then became something else, but it was originally called Inspired by Jillian. Oh, my God. And then it became IVG, and it was called uh, Inspired Believe Give, and we did a huge charity event with Jillian Anderson David Company. They were so lovely, and I have my moment of zen picture with them. And we raised a lot of money for this uh, this great charity in South Africa. So it all ended up well. But I mean, that's my nerdy, 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 no, nerdy. No. nerdy. I, I love fan that. Girl. I fangirl. We, this I site is built on fangirls. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like Super fangirl, shipping hardcore. and all like, of that? Like Orphan Black, I mean, is my shit right now. And I'm so bummed that they're ending season five. And the Tatiana puts on I'm not bummed about that. I'm so stoked that she finally got it. I mean, the girl and plays Emma. enough roles. Like, I was always yes. telling people, because, you know, my you know my hoity-toity film and TV people, they're like, well, you know, this is not Downton Abbey. She plays five roles. Yeah, <laughs> and more, because they keep yeah. bringing in characters. Yeah. And, like, it was so funny, because I read on Twitter, so I'm like, oh, I heard a rumor that she played all of her fellow nominees tonight. Dude. <laughs> she did a damn good job yeah. at it. <laughs> anyway. But she is up against some heavy hitters. Yeah. I mean, like, fucking Viola Davis yes. from How to Get Away with Murder. Yeah. You, that's like she fears and uh, Taraji from yeah. Empire. But again, I'm still really happy for her. Oh, yeah. I was so stoked because I was like, well deserved. Like, she's, yeah. she's needed that. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for sitting down with us again. And much luck with the movie. Again, it's 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 got its little niche, but I do feel like our audience will like it. And I, I wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you so much. No thank problem. You. Bye. Sasha Lane stars in the film American Honey, a story about a teenage girl with nothing to lose who joins a traveling magazine sales crew and gets caught up in a whirlwind of hard partying, law bending, and young love as she crosses the Midwest with a band of misfits. The film was selected to compete for the Palme d'Or at the 2016 Cannes Film Festival. At Cannes, it won the Prix du Jury. And you can catch coverage about the film at blackgirlnerds.com, where we covered it over at TIFF. So here we are sitting with Miss Sasha Lane from the new film American Honey, which is right here at Fantastic Fest. She just got back from TIFF. So how does it feel to bring this film back to Texas, your home state? Honestly, I've been more excited for this than anything to be back in Texas and with like my people and to share it with them, especially because they know more of this lifestyle than other people from like LA and all those places. It's really cool. I'm really stoked. Yeah, so this is your first film, and you basically got discovered, so you were waiting tables, or she saw you at a diner, so explain how she, the director, came across you. She actually, I was, that was before, I was in college, and I went on spring break in Florida, and she found me on the beach, and I ended up, like, hanging out with her for a week, because I was to go to South by Southwest, but she wanted me to stay, so I stayed with her in Florida. By the end of the week, she told me she wanted me to do it, so I finished up school and then went to film. Wow. And yeah. so before that, though, you acted... Uh... Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. So what is that like, realizing you're going to be doing an independent film, but still, you know, multi-million dollar movie with major stars like Shia LaBeouf and yeah. Riley Clough? It's so weird because I'm actually really uncomfortable and really awkward, and that's why we never pursue something like that, so... I can't imagine how I did it, but it's also, I was at a point where I was like, I have nothing left to lose, and I had a really overwhelming feeling of, this is what you should be doing, do it, do it, do it, you know, like, it'll work out, so 
I just kind of went for it. And it's so surprising to this day. I'm still like, what happened? What, what did we just do? Yeah, because it's a huge whirlwind. So, yeah. you know, you guys first go to Cannes. Yeah. And have that whole great reception. And then, like, tell me about that when you guys first premiered. Because this is a very American film. Mm -hmm. It talks about, you know, disaffected American youth mm -hmm. and, and the, sh the sort of... I guess poverty and, and adolescence and all of the drug addiction and all the mm -hmm. things that you know young people deal with. How was that taking it to you know King Can to all these French posh people? Um, yes, I was kind of like, how are they going to see? But I also built up this thing in me that was, you either get it or you don't get it, and the ones who don't get it are the ones who aren't open to seeing that. They just like how my entire life has been, just like the reason this film is being made. You overlook us because you just no, nope, don't want to think about that world, you know, so I didn't care, but the amount of love we received there and to have, you know, like these posh people and all these hanging out with this, like, ah, American honey and, you know, that life. And I'm like, ah, you cool, homie. Like, yeah, <laughs> sweet. It was really, it was actually very surprising in, in such a good way. That's awesome. So tonight it's going to be a fantastic fest, mm -hmm. which is here in Austin, Texas. And so tell me about your background. You know, you're from Texas. Did you know these folks that are sort of represented in the film? Were you one of these people you feel represented in the film? How do you feel your background helped you portray the character? Um, I mean, I feel like I'm so close with Lisa Star. I mean, like the whole looking on after your siblings, you know, just knowing life. She knows life. She's been through life despite how young she is. And just like all these other characters, it's, yeah, we live a certain lifestyle, and we all had a purpose of being there. I feel like we were kind of looking for something, which is why we found family in each other. That's very close to me. I um, That free living, like, all of it is just so very personal, and I just took from my own experiences and just kind of, like, went for it. But, I mean, I know I see these types of people every day, and these are the type of people I root for in life, and I wish others would see. I wish they would see me, obviously, before this. You know, like, I was like... I swear there's something beautiful in here, you know, like, just yeah. look past this and just see, like, there's a soul and to feel, to feel like you have to question your own self for being who you are, like, thinking, like, should I change? No, like, that sucks, you know, like, everyone's so themselves and they're beautiful in their own ways. Yeah, that's one thing I will say watching the film. It's a very simple story, but it's very authentic and honest. Like, mm -hmm. you don't feel any of the characters or caricatures of yeah. something. They feel very real, but the cast is mixed between relatively unknown and yeah. non-professional actors to, you know, professional actors. Um, what was that like balancing between, you know, some of y'all are learning how to hit your marks for the first time and then you have someone like Shia that's been acting for 20 years? It's so weird because there was no difference. There was no, we never once felt like you are a professional actor and we are off the street. What do we do together? It was we are all down for the same reason. We're here for the same reason. We're all just going with this and living this life. We're in a bubble. We became family. And I think that's pretty amazing. Like there was no weird dynamic. There was no higher level. And so it was cool. We were just all people just, I mean, we were all picked for a reason. Andrea is definitely not one to just pick people, you know? So you can everyone, tell. Yeah. So everyone was meant to be there. And I think, we all understood that, and we all just kind of went for it. Yeah, I could say that with all the characters. They all have, you know, obviously a look to them, but they also have, I would say, a personality yes. and things that are unsaid. But I will say this, you know, this is your first film, but you should feel very lucky as a female because being directed by a female, you know, in Hollywood, it's kind of a rare thing. It's oh something gosh, we yeah. talk about all the time. How do you think having her voice, like, do you think it maybe helped you first take the role or once you got in the role, be more comfortable? How was that? I think before anything, her as a person, regardless of woman or male, just her energy and her trusting, like just something about her made me be like, all right, cool. And also as a woman, I think she has a better understanding of the complications of people in life, you know? And so she is, she one character is not just a mean person. He is a broken person. He is this. She is, there's something about her. She thinks this for this reason. There's so many different things that she took into consideration. And I think not most like men probably won't really go for or understand. And also she just had this sense of like comfort with us and trust and like looking out after us. And it was just kind of, 
it's really beautiful and it's also I just had so much respect for her because one of she's amazing and two like she's a woman who has a vision and she's strong and she's doing what she's doing and you're just like of course I'll do whatever you want yeah no and and it shows in the in the film because it is a very like I said an honest film but it's also very intimately yes, shot you know yes, um, a lot of the shots are you know just you your face and how you, the things around you are affecting your um, your character, and it's a lot of unsaid scenes, yeah. right? So, how scary was that? Knowing that you know this is twenty seconds of just you trying to convey something. That was probably like I'm so into people, and I'm so into expressing these things, and I love you know like I feel like I feel energies very strong, and I wish to put them out in a strong way, and so. It was kind of, it was cool, the fact that, like, Sasha, you can use this and put it out there, but it's also very vulnerable, you know, I don't like, I think showing your emotions is a beautiful thing, and I don't think it makes you weak, but I still, personally, because of how I grew up, and just, no matter what, I would constantly, like, don't show your emotions, you block that off, hide it, whatever, and you're staring at me for 20 seconds at a time, straight into my soul, and it's kind of like, wow, that is a lot for someone to see, you know, since I've so connected so personally to it now it's out there in the world and I'm like you are taking a glimpse into my mind and my heart and everything yeah and um yeah it, it's true as someone that's seen the film if you could tell anyone maybe in our audience about the film and try to give them why they should see it, it what would you tell them as far as this movie I guess along the lines of like there is so much beauty in people and parts of this world that so many people overlook and you just have to give it a chance. Just like I feel like you need to give people a chance, you have to give this movie a chance. Just let it happen and feel it out. And you can just, that spirit in everyone, that beauty in everyone, just really shines through. And I think that's something that everyone needs to see and experience because, like, wow, you know, everything's complicated and you got to have respect for that. Yeah. All right, so to sum up, um, we're a site for women of color that love all things geek. So I like to ask everyone, what is your super secret geeky behavior? What is this geeky thing that you do that people wouldn't know about? When I start, like, waving my hands and, like, doing this weird, like, hand stuff, that's me trying to create my little, like, vibe, and it makes me feel comfortable. I'm like, all right, I'm building this, like, world around me, which is really weird because I'm just, like, Blah, blah, blah. But I mean, it does my little <laughs> thing. This is a so podcast, like, but you can't see. She's yeah. doing this like basically belly dance move. Right yeah, now. <laughs> and I'm just like waving away the uncomfortable and creating my little bubble. <laughs> That's very cool. Well, thank you so much for thank sitting down so and chat with us, and much luck with the film. And thank you. Thank again. you. I appreciate right. it. In our final segment, we chat with the cast of Shadowhunters. Shadowhunters is an American fantasy television series based on the Mortal Instruments by Cassandra Clare, and it was developed for television by Ed Dechter. It is the second adaptation of the novel series after the 2013 film The Mortal Instruments, City of Bones, which, like Shadowhunters, was produced by Constantine Film. The show received a straight-to-series order back in March of 2015 and premiered on the Freeform Network on January of this year. It's been announced that the series has been renewed for a second season of 20 episodes, which is set to premiere on January 2nd of next year. The following segment is in this order. We start with characters Clary Frey and Isabel Lightwood. Then we move to characters Luke Garraway, Magnus Bain, and Simon Lewis. Then we speak to producers Todd Slavkin and Darren Swimmer, as well as author Cassandra Clare. And in the final roundtable of interviews, features characters Jace Wayland and Alec Lightwood. Well, what do we have to look forward to as far as Sizzy? Uh, Sizzy? Take it away. Uh, Sizz- no, Sizzy is far out. Far out. Far out. I don't yes. think we're going to see Sizzy in, in uh, episode, uh, in season two. Maybe. I mean, not the first ten episodes. We don't know. It's, it's we don't know. We're only shooting episode yeah. six right so, now. So, so we're, far, it's, yeah, it's, it's getting there. You know, it's, uh, climate needs to happen first. Climate, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Climate's got to happen before Clizzy. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, then what about Clizzy? Do we have Lizzie? a lot of Clizzy? Yeah, uh, <laughs> we do, actually. The, the girls have always had a very sisterly bond. And now that Clary's sort of becoming coming into her own as a shadow hunter, Isabel's taking her under her wing. 
I'm sorry, you guys saw that fight scene yeah. that they just released. So that's from episode one. Well, it was strange um, to me because it was too much, Right, right. But... And it only, it only builds from there, yeah. you know? So both of your characters right, had these really complex, complicated relationships with their mothers. Yeah. Right? So what can you guys tease about how we're going to see both of them sort of grow with their mothers and then maybe through that mutual understanding yeah, bond with each other? So far, um, I haven't had much conversation with my mom uh, this time around. But what I can, I can tell you that's happening with Izzy is that, you know, she is struggling between her friendship with uh, Clary and, you know, trying to please Alec at the same time because, you know, there's all this friction between them. And, you know, she wants to be the best shadow hunter she can be. So she might, or she may or may not make the wrong choice. And it's going to lead her, you know, through a really dark path. And now that Jocelyn's away, Clary finally has to confront the fact that her mother lied to her for 18 years and that she hid this whole world from her. And, you know, Clary had this one concept of what their relationship was. And finding out that her mother hid all of this from her and took her memories and did all of these things, it, it, it comes as quite a shock and almost a betrayal to her. And on top of that, Jocelyn still sees Clary as this little girl that we saw at the beginning of episode one, but Clary's grown and she's matured. She's a shadow hunter now. So getting her mother to, to see her as that is, is a bit of a challenge and it causes a lot of tension in the relationship. Like, yeah, and also, oh, by the way, you know, your your son's alive. Yeah, that's a bit of a. <laughs> but a way like, to... yeah, like when we start season two, we're dealing with a lot of aftermath from season one. That's a lot of heavy things. Like, I, do, do your characters kind of go into a sort of dark place, or do you guys always kind of remain the light on the show? No, uh, Izzy is gonna go through a dark phase. That's really interesting. That's not in the books. It's really cool that I love. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> and and Clary does too, but she does in a different way, because she something that I love about Clary is she always has this ember of hope within her, and that's that's part of what makes her a hero is that she has this undying hope and this this willingness to believe that it will turn out okay and that they will eventually make things right. But that that dark place comes through Clary in a place of determination, in a place of strength, and you see a bit of Clary's fighter. You see her soldier, you see the shadow hunter, you see the warrior within her come out in times of need. And she does get violent when she needs to. You get to see that this season. I'm excited. I did a wire stunt last week and I'm so really, I'm a high from it. Well, it's always nice to see the cast female. Yeah. That's right. And that's what we are. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So do you guys have, you, both of your characters have had these really incredible empowering arcs growth for women that we don't usually get to see is there a is there a moment in what you've shot so far that you really feel like will stick out to female fans i mean i remember when izzy sent the fire letter to Melior and i it was the first time i cried and i immediately connected with her i was like this is we see women constantly give themselves up for the people that they care about around them and clary does this too she goes to the ends of the earth for the people jocelyn does it so is there a moment in what you shot that you really feel like the girls watching this will be like, yes, I know what that means, and I relate to that. It happens with Clary in how she deals with Jace, because she knows what he's going through more than anyone, because she also had to deal with the fact that that one is her father, and she knows what kind of self-doubt that can bring about, and she knows that dark place that it's very easy to slip into when you're in Valentine's grasp. But Clary had the support of all these guys to bring her out of it. Jace doesn't have that because he's with them. So she's constantly trying to get to him and fighting for him and fighting because he's also under all of this suspicion, just as she is, of, you know, the clave, obviously, your Valentine's kid, okay, you must be evil. But holding on to the fact, to her goodness within her and fighting for Jace against the clave, fighting for Jace against Valentine, struggling and calling tooth and nail to get him back and pull him out of the dark place is a huge part of her season. I think this is going to be something also really nice between Clary and Isabel. You've seen us be super close. Oh, yeah. And there's going to be a time where, for the first time, you're going to see us argue. Mm -hmm. And I think those that's what friends do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you guys, you know, Never get super mad at each other. <laughs> and then you guys are happy with each other. So I think that's going to be really nice, a real nice uh, scene. Yeah, and that's what's great, because you haven't seen that before. They've always been on the same page, and then yeah, the it's same throw down. It's like, what, what's up? Yeah, The like, clash of the females is happening. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Harry, I spoke with Michael earlier this year uh, after the season Michael? ended. Michael, Michael Reese. Okay, yes. uh, about uh, Malik and sort of writing that episode. And while it didn't make it into the interview, he mentioned 
it being really important that um, Magnus be shown as this independent character who wasn't just sort of this fallback. Yes. Are we going to get to see more of Magnus sort of coming out, more of his backstory, his other relationships? Is he going to fall in line? Is he going to feel like he's part of the group instead yeah. of sort of the outsider? Yeah, I think, you know, this first season, you know, kind of played into a lot of the chase. You know, you see a lot of chase, and there's a lot of things alluded to what happened behind the scenes, uh, or like off screen, I guess. And uh, this season, particularly, I, we're definitely getting to know more about Magnus's past and and how it, why he is the way he is. I think that's an important aspect, and why uh, he's kind of functioned the way he has for over centuries. Uh, the things that really, truly, uh, pivotal moments that really affected him. I think he voices it, and also through relationships and you get to see a lot of Magnus interacting with Simon as well which is I think uh, really really fun um, and even the, the elements of Raphael and, and the relationship between Magnus and Raphael and, and, and going back to Camille but there's, there's a lot that, that we're going to explore and I'm really excited to, for people to see like what Magnus is, is about outside of the you know the character that we've kind of known him to you know whether it be uh, certain parts of the books or, or whether it be just from seeing the first season so yeah I think that Shadowhunters does a great job of making every character well-rounded. Like we get an idea of who everybody is, and there's not really, even though it's you know focused in its Clary story, I feel like we really get to connect. And how was that for you guys to like be able to really dive into your characters? I think that's what this season's really about. The second season, right. we're we're going into each character in depth. We're learning, like I guess we learn a lot about Magnus. We get to see Luke in a new way. We get to learn a lot about Luke, how he is, who he is, how he became who he is, and then. Uh, it's very cool that we get to we really need to learn about these people in a new way. That was, yeah, that was very important for the writers yeah. and, and for us, I think, to, mm -hmm. to really have that. So Isaiah, you mentioned in the panel that um, we're going to get a little more Lucillin, oh. right? Yeah. You'll, you'll definitely get that. Okay, get that. so they've had this relationship. Yes. Are we going to get more of the flashbacks of who they were? And then going forward, you mentioned tension. Well, so I just assumed it was going to be lovey-dovey, but you suggested otherwise. Well, yes. I think I think you're going to see a lot of changes. Definitely, um, you're definitely going to see some flashbacks. I can tell you that for a fact. I just finished shooting one, so um, <laughs> you get to get you get into a little bit of Luke's um, early history in New York City. But the relationship, like I said it, at, on the panel, all relationships have ups and downs, and you know have their peaks and valleys, and whatnot. You're definitely going to see. Luke and Jocelyn go through some ish, you know. But it, but it's you know, Clary's at the at the middle of it. It's it's basically like you know, two parents talking about how they're raising this child in this shadow world. So I mean, I, I don't want to say like Luke is a full on parent, but he is, you know. So you're you're going to see where they can kind of conflict and where they agree on things. Did you guys have any uh, freedom to kind of bring something new to the character yourselves, like almost like an improv thing? I know it's fun and they, they, they sometimes, only sometimes if we have time, they'll let me have a take where they say, you have the freedom here. Okay. Uh, for the first time, I got that a couple of nights ago with, uh, with Maya, shooting for one of our scenes in Simon's van. Where they were like, you know what, you guys, take, take this one and run, because we got what we need now. So we get some improvisation there. As far as the way the characters are being built, it, it is, it's collaborative to an extent. It, they come to you, they say, hey, this is what we want. This is what we're looking at. This is what we're doing. And then naturally, because Simon is mine, I get to be like, yeah. Totally agree. You know, I don't know if that path is the best. I think I agree, but maybe we can take instead of going directly this way, just like this way. It just it's it's, it's like it's a conversation. It's a conversation. It, it, it's definitely they definitely listen, which is really cool. You're you're, you're allowed to have the conversation. With, yes. Yeah. You know, um, where, whereas I think in some shows, may, that that may not be. Yeah. Well, I mean, you are taking it from a book, but I feel like you guys are definitely going a different route. Than the book yeah, because it has to feel natural. I mean, there's certain things that, like, things from the book that are put into the scene might not completely fit, and it, it, we don't want it to look like we're just trying to force it in. So there has to be, like, an organic feel to it, what that um, situation is and how it would play out with these certain characters. Yeah. What was your favorite thing to film uh, so far? Season, season one? As of or, or so far in season yeah. I, I have to say, the, the scene that I just filmed uh, with Maya... Um, recently was was probably one of the most touching and, and more like whoa scenes that I've, I've filmed with the Shadow Hunters. It, it, it was really it was really deep. It was really deep. And then after that, you get to yeah, you get to know a lot of history. Yeah, you get all that. 
for me, you know, we've gotten to have like a lot of emotional scenes and and and, and, and humorous kind of like scenes. But I, for me, it was when the anger of Magnus kind of there's a scene where you get to see the angry side of him and and what he's capable of with his magic. And I think that was really a uh, that was really fun to shoot because it's a totally different side and I got to bring out a different element than, than just vulnerability or, you know, it was more of like this don't mess with Magnus and I, I think I like it's really yeah. nice to see that. I like that. <laughs> um, for me, it's anytime Simon starts to try to own the small vampire traits that he now has. Well, because a lot of that sometimes it entails like a wire work or some sort of stunt, but also it's because it's, it's that, um, that growing confidence. It's like, oh, I can, I can do this now. Can I do this? And it, it, I like playing with that. That where where can I push Simon? Like how how far does he want to go right now? And can I say, I'm sorry, can I, say, I, I I think he's just doing like an incredible job with that character. Like every time I see him on screen or in a scene with him, he's 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 taking that character not in like a like a typical way of like oh what a vampire would do, but I think he he owns it and it's always so enjoyable yeah, yeah. because it comes from oh, such so a grounded fun. place so it's really really good Dan's are so really defensive of your acting yeah, I have to say anybody yeah. talks smack <laughs> come and move like no 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 <laughs> not on right now and as they should thank you guys thank you thank you guys, thank you guys. How you guys doing? Good. Are you? Good. Great. <laughs> well, I know there was a little changeover and everything. Like, did it change anything as far as your plans for season two? No, not really. I mean, we we uh, well, we came in fairly late in the game, um, so we're taking what was done in season one and, and we're trying to elevate what already was cool and just try to make it cooler that comes from adding more emotion to the show deepening the characters in the show um making the world bigger stunts are cooler hired a great stunt corner visual effects are cooler sets are bigger new york city is all over the show um everything's just trying to add richness and texture to, to something that was already cool i think you'll see the look is a little bit darker a little bit grittier a little bit reflecting, you know, it's an urban fantasy genre. And, you know, we want to kind of bring that into the show yeah, just a little bit. Really you know, and that's the Diving deeper into those characters yeah. and yeah. having a little bit more knowledge as far as their backgrounds. Sure. I mean, our yeah. goal is to write scenes where the actors show up in the morning and say, I can't wait to act in that scene, right? Because as a writer, that turns us on when we're, when we're you know, we are get so excited, we're crying, we're laughing, blah, blah, blah. So the act, translating to the actors, I think you guys will see that in performance. Um, they're all so invested now. These kids are so turned on by the material. And um, watching them, I'm so proud. I mean, being on that panel and seeing how great they are, they're, they're doing great. So you guys have teased the Sealy Queen, and one of my favorite things about this book universe is how rich the downworld is. Like, it's this whole entire universe of, of cultures that are sort of colliding and coexisting. So how much more of that are we going to get to see? Because you guys already talked about sort of the technology upgrades for the Institute, which is exciting, but what of the downworld should we expect? You know, with Valentine out there creating a threat to everybody... And the way the clave is responding to it puts a lot of pressure on the sort of uneasy alliance between the different groups. And we find that really interesting. The wolf pack, the vampires, the sea leaves. Later in, in, in the first 10, it's going to sort of you know, become even more tense between the You'll, you'll have to wait for 2B for your for your silly moment, but there is a great scene in 2A where all the heads of the downworlds of the Godfather get together, and you have, you know, the warlock and the werewolves and the vampires and the seniors in this meeting of what are we going to do. So you really hit it on the head, which is the downworld is Cassie's created, it's not just vampires, it's not just werewolves, right? It's so expansive, and we want to um, explore the different relationships too like Maya and Simon it's a vampire and werewolves don't like each other of course not but yes they do because they can relate and it's like wait you did what wait you did that and she can't talk to Clary like he can talk to Maya because Maya understands what that's like and Clary's kind of like well really you know you did that and so creating all those dynamics is, is so so fun speaking on Maya is there anything you can kind of tease about what's to expect total awesomeness <laughs> <laughs> the actress is so good 
she is, her name's Alicia Wayne, right? She's young. We saw her audition. We flipped. We put her, in, she's in episode three as her first. And, so, and, you know, we're watching, you never know. You just never know. We're watching the cut and it's like, oh my God. She's funny, she's sexy, she's charming, she kicks total ass, um, including Jace's, and it's really fun. And she plays with Luke a lot, and she plays with Simon, and she plays with Jace, and um, and a little bit of Clary, but as Cassie said earlier, Clary's kind of on the outside, because there's Simon, all these people are now down roles, you know? But she's great, I think the fans are really going to enjoy her quite a bit. So Cassie, um as far as they're taking from your material, was there anything, since I know you're part of the writing team now, um, the show, is there anything you wanted to make sure they included? I mean, I'm not officially part of the writing team. Tom and Darren have been super great about including me, calling me, running through things with me, asking permission for some stuff that's probably going to blow your mind <laughs> because it's, uh, it's an interesting and new direction on stuff from the books. And that's been great because in the first season, I really didn't have any input. And I feel like, you know, this, this season I feel much more included and I feel much more like this, this season will honor the spirit of the books in a, in a way that I really hope that will work for people who've read the books and will be surprised and will also hopefully appreciate some deepening and, you know, some you know, of the world and getting to see more of it and, and, and getting to, you know, and getting to see kind of the, the world behind the world that we, that we see with Clary and now we kind of like expand out and see things from other people's point of views too. But, you know, I think that they also will appreciate getting to see some of the things that they, like the Sealy Court scene, that they remember and love and, you know, are going to be happy to see that because it's such a game changer for all of the relationships. I had I, I had said a couple of things that I wanted and, and, and we'll see. Like, like, one of them was the Sealy Court and they were like, yep. Oh, and one of them was Sebastian. And I can't say anything about that, but I was like, that was like one of the first things I said. I was like, so, let's talk Sebastian. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, he's like my favorite question. villain. So, one of my favorite things about your universe is the pair of relationship, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to fighting. And one of the things I know a lot of fans wanted to see more of was more action sequences. These are warriors, right? So, can you talk a little bit about what you feel like you really want to see in terms of the, the physicality of Alec and Jace and their pair of a tie relationship and then maybe what you sort of have plans for because in the pilot we got that really awesome like unison fight sequence and I was like more of this we didn't really get that so are we are we going to see more of that and, and what parts of that do you want to see yeah, I mean, I'm totally with you on that. I think part of that was that Mick G directed the pilot, and he was super into that idea of power about by fighting, and then, he, you know, that, but you, you get different directors, they're into different things. I mean, I think the, the, that, from what I've seen, Dar Tom Darren and also the network are super invested in the whole, like, concept of power about They love it, you know, they love the idea of this deep friendship, of friendship being, like, really respected and honored in this way that's unusual, and that, for me, the idea that the power about by fighting creates a different kind of physicality between the characters that you see that in Emma with Julian, you see it with Jem and Will, and you see it with Alec and Jace. They move together. They anticipate each other's movements, you know, um, and I, there's a really great bit, I'm going to spoil some stuff, in the first uh, episode where Alec is talking to Magnus and he says, Jace is the other half of me, and if he dies, a part of me dies too. And I was like, I'm so glad to hear that articulated. Because, you know, I really felt like, unless you were a book fan, it might have been something that you didn't quite get in the first season. And I was, like, so glad to see that and so glad to see the way that, they, you know, that they're going to develop that. And I know there's going to, I can't tell you anymore, but I know there's going to be a ton of Jace yes. and Alec stuff that their relationship is really significant. Um, and there's a great new stunt guy. He's amazing. And he definitely <laughs> talked about what, it, you know, it meant to be a power about time, how you fight together. So I'm really excited to see how that goes on screen. You're going to be happy. Yeah, if you're a Pirabatai fan, you know, <laughs> yeah. not necessarily about the really fighting, <laughs> because because quite honestly, that, that fighting of it all, which wasn't a pilot, but you, you will get to see the Pirabatai ceremony when they were children. Yeah, the, oh, there's know, a flashback. I flat didn't know we were flat. allowed to say that. Yeah, we are allowed to say awesome. that. Oh, so, so that, yeah, it's really cool. And we cast these great young actors. So, so we get to see the evolution. We see the Lizzie, and we get to see all of that. It, it's really special. You know, it made like me cry. Chibis. It really is a special <laughs> show. Oh, yeah. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. How are you guys? Oh, hi. Yeah. How are you? Good. So this season, we have some exciting things, I would think, coming up for both of your characters. You're kind of yeah. in a dark place. You have a new relationship with Magnus, and you're also kind of going against the brain in a way. 
Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to your parents. So how's that? Is there anything you can kind of tease about that? The primary concern is Jace. Initially, that's what's driving his his problems, or his, uh, his sort of his personality at the moment. And luckily, Magnus is there to help. Sometimes. And we can't really talk about him as we've explained because he's, it's like the primary storyline. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I basically can't say anything. Mm-hmm. We, it, it gets worse for Jace before it gets better. Um, and we, uh, we we find him back on the ship. He's with Valentine. And Valentine's going to, you know, he's going he's gonna to do him. He's going to try and take over the world in, in whatever way he thinks is most appropriate using whichever weapons he thinks will work most efficiently. Is that, is that all right? I think I did pretty good. Yeah, right? Nice. <laughs> so one of the things I was really excited to see in the sizzle reel was that Alex was going after Jace so hard. It was it, I, In the finale, I was like, I feel like Alec is going to be one of the people that is fighting to get his, his partner back. Yeah, um, it, yeah I mean, it's, that's what consumes him. And until he finds, you know, and, and, and as I was saying before, he, he'll do anything to get him back. Jace's motives for leaving are unclear. But it doesn't matter to Alec. What's important to Alec is getting his therapy tie back and then asking questions and then trying to solve that problem. But the most important thing is get them back so that they can both feel complete because when they're separated like that and they don't know where each other are, that's, you know, that's not good for them. So what's that the flip side like for Jace? Again, it's really hard to, to kind of say anything at this point. Um, yeah, we don't know why Jace left. Jace left either to save his friends or to... Uh, be with his father because he believes that that's where he belongs and we don't know the answer to that yet so I can't say anything well, like, I mean, no, he's, miss, he's missing Alec he's, he's, he's missing, missing Alec yeah he's missing he's missing Alec endlessly he's and um, he, uh, Jace has a lot to go through and to experience and to learn about himself before he can come back and be a valued member of, of the Shadow Hunters yeah J- Jace has to experience find out some stuff about some himself. Stuff, yeah. yeah, and it reaches it actually reaches a really uh, really great uh, interesting peak in three. Yeah. Which Absolutely. I think everyone's gonna really enjoy. Yeah. So I'm um, I'm guessing this season is probably a lot about growth within each character and Oh within every character. We have the time. Yeah. We have yeah. the twenty episodes so we have the time to really show that growth in a in a real way in a meaningful way that will allow people to connect with these characters or change, and connect or to, or and change. change. it's and not necessarily yeah. growth on the on no, 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 it it sometimes with, it's yeah. a horizontal Absolutely. movement it's, yeah it's not it's, 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 it's just it's, uh, it's all change like, yeah. for sure I think is the best way because Izzy's doesn't so far kind of go up or down it's she kind of Lateral. sideways yeah. very lateral yeah and that happens with characters but changes is always interesting and it's interesting for characters to explore New things with different environment, with different information, having changed. We have a lot of friends, fans in Brazil. Yeah, they love you so much. Could you please send them a message? What should we send out to <laughs> single out countries? No. <laughs> uh, no, we can't. We yeah, can't no, 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 absolutely, not. absolutely not. Yeah. Um, so we will say, hello, Brazil. <laughs> I. I really would like to visit one day. Me too. And to meet all of you because you guys are so great online. Yeah. And uh, it's been really fun to see all you guys so enthusiastic about the show. And also, eventually, you know, I- I'm learning little words of Portuguese, which to some of you might come as a surprise. How does, surprise. How does that feel for you guys with Thank the you. fandom? Because they, you know, everything that you guys say, it's, they it's, hang it's on so, to. So, it's, it's just, it's actually really nice because it's, it, you know, Take today for example, it was a, it was a lot. There was a lot of people there, and it was a lot of screaming fans. But it's it's also Positive. it's a thousand people saying like you're doing a good job. We enjoy what you do. Congratulations, like you're doing well. And it's it's Matt said it the best. He said it. You know, he says that it's like going to work every day and having everyone at work being like, good job. We like you. You're doing well, which yeah. is wonderful. It's it is, really, it is. really wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the best part. Of the, of the job in a lot of ways is, is the, the reaction from people who enjoy the work you do. Yeah, and I think that you know, you've really touched a lot of people with this show. Like, it's really... I hope so, yeah. Really yeah. quickly, too. That's the thing, too. Like, it's hard. Some shows don't reach out to fans for a few seasons. You guys did it from, like, no, the right, get-go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. That's very sweet of you. Yeah. 
The Black Girl Nerds podcast is produced by Jamie Brodnax. Various episodes are edited by Jamie Brodnax, M.R. Daniel, and John Bauer. The opening theme song to our show is written and performed by Samus. Various instrumentals are performed by Samus, Sky Blue, and Shubzilla. You can find episodes of the Black Girl Nerds podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spreaker, and Spotify. That was a HeadGum Podcast.